Now we move to the next speaker, Professor William Keenan, the president of IPAF and member of the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor to introduce Professor Keenan. Title, Neonatal Care Education. What's the global scale and what's the updates? Welcome, Professor Keenan. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here and distinguished chairpersons. Um, the title uh, uh, given was the neonatal care education, and I wanted to give you a few updates about that. Uh, I have no relevant um, uh, conflicts, um, as, as was defined yesterday. So the, the world of early neonatal deaths, this is an exaggerated map to show you the relative risk for newborns around the world, and you can see um, Africa, of course. Um, uh, you can see uh, Canada is this very skinny blue over to your left. And um, so th this just shows that there's quite a disparity, but it also shows maybe there's more opportunity to do better. So we're all interested. Our shared goal is uh, survival and well-being of, of all children. And, um, and that obviously begins when you're a newborn. The IPA, uh, one of the groups that I work with, uh, is their theme is every child, every age, everywhere. And uh, we all share this. So we're together in our endeavors. If we're going to improve perinatal care, it's, uh, it's a sequence of things that includes us, includes our communities, includes the families, prenatal care, nutrition, etc. It all contributes to uh, a perinatal outcome. And we know this, we're pediatricians. And the, the concepts and policies that we follow to pursue some of these goals uh, we conceive of the first uh, thousand days, and we know about the importance of maternal well-being. We know the, the influence of environment. Uh, and um, if we're going to be effective, everybody who cares for the child, all the, the whole spectrum of workforce needs to be trained and equipped to do a good job. And we need the right policies and the right education to carry this out. So we're, we're all together with this. So uh, in the newborn, there are particular um, um, events, qualities that uh, newborn resuscitation obviously comes very early in your care of the child. Hygiene was mentioned, uh, Mobin was talking about the hygiene and how important that is. Breastfeeding, we talked a little bit about it yesterday. Nutrition in general, thermal protection, the, the, the uh, feelings that the family has towards their newly born baby, obviously critical whether that baby is even going to survive, yet alone thrive. So the family bonding, and we, we're also interested in problem solving and planning and manage, management. So we have this entire spectrum of responsibilities. And this shows a graph that you're probably quite familiar with about the causes of neonatal death. Preterm babies uh, give us uh, uh, quite a challenge. Uh, severe infections and asphyxia or intrapartum events. Uh, that's, uh, you know, about three quarters of the uh, risk of, of uh, newborn death. And we also know this concept that things that cause babies to die will also cause injury to a number of babies who won't die. So, like in general, a, an asphyxiated baby, for every baby who dies of asphyxia, there are about six that have permanent injury. So we're not just concerned, not just focused on survival, but we want the child to do well. And the, you know, one example of, uh, of uh, this issue is that the consequences of poor neonatal resuscitation, there is death, but there's disability, burden, direct uh, community costs, burden on the family, and the loss of productivity, which in 
affects the entire community. So this is just a, an example of uh, some risks that the baby might have, and you can see that uh, attended deliveries uh, uh, in, in, in general, uh, prepared people to care for the baby is quite low. And if you look at some of these country by country, I've, I've got Rwanda in the middle there, and Rwanda has done a tremendous job since the, uh, these data were collected, and they're doing better and better. So Burson facilities, attendance trained for neonatal resuscitation, and then if we'll talk about what comes after resuscitation, and whether there's even equipment. If somebody was trained, is there equipment there that would enable them to care for the baby? So huge challenges around the world. So there are some educational um, events that are, uh, clearly demonstrate progress. So uh, WHO and UN have, have uh, adopted a theme of every woman, every child as a central theme of their activities around the world. So that's, that's big, a big step. Uh, when I was at the um, UN meeting a couple of years ago, newborn infants was mentioned for the first time ever in the UN. So I think we're making some progress and getting policy makers to understand some of the things that we know so well. There's an every newborn action plan that's been adopted at the UN and, and um, and WHO, which is a newly energized process that really will, if we follow this, it's a country-centered plan that will help us carry out policies and investments at the country level that will make a big difference for, for babies and all pediatrics in general, and all families, of course. And then uh, we've got a, a program called Helping Babies Survive, uh, the AAP and WHO. Um, it's, uh, it's finally an educational program that really works and everybody can be trained. So, so those are the, the progress that I would cite. So the Every Newborn Action Plan is a national-based plan uh, that every country is supposed to come up with a a plan and, a, and, and policy um, a formation that will meet the needs of newborn infants. And we can see from those early slides, a lot of the basic needs for newborns is not being met. So the global expectation is that every country will have a plan and that there is potential funding for these kinds of plans. Uh, the poorest countries and there's a global financing facility where all the donors put their money together and then to try to have a strategic impact on, on outcome. Are we better coordinated? Well, as a matter of fact, I think we are. I think uh, academics and uh, leadership in WHO, uh, certainly in AAP and uh, some of our other societies, we're really paying attention to some of these issues now. ILCOR is the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation, and they have taken up the, the science of newborn resuscitation, which is relatively straightforward, uh, but we've got coordination at some of these planning levels. And so we now uh, are working on, and I think very close to having a global education standard where the pediatric societies and WHO come up with the same answers for the same problems. So take away some of the confusion that has previously existed in trying to teach people what they should do and when they should do it. And I think we've acquired a focus that it's not just in-service or conferences, but we really need to prepare the nurses, the physicians, the midwives who are in school to have some focus on newborn health, that that's going to make a difference in the long run. So this is an, an example of uh, educational programs that we've been working on, and this is entitled Helping Babies Breathe, which is a, a, a basic resuscitation plan that is color-coded, and it's mostly pictorial, so somebody doesn't have to be a, a very good reader in order to carry out a plan. So in color code, in the green, the baby's doing well, 
baby is delivered, is dried, is placed with the mother, skin to skin with the mother, and breastfeeding is encouraged. There's a yellow where the baby may, may, may need some support and, and to then try to make a transition to the green zone to be with the mother, to be, to be warm, and uh, to be breastfed. And then there's a, a red zone where the baby uh, will require more support, and, uh, which would include bag and mass ventilation, airway management, those kinds of things. So try to simplify this for everybody who will be caring for the baby in this color-coded way, a pictorial way to illustrate these issues. It, the science that's used is really a fairly old science, and there are animal studies and some human studies that pretty much look like this, where the breathing is at the top graph, the heart rate is in the middle graph, and the blood pressure is on the bottom graph. And if there's apnea, the, the, the baby will breathe a bit and then and sometimes gasp and then last gasp and they'll be in terminal apnea. And pretty qu quickly with um, uh, apnea, the heart rate will go down. So we use heart rate as a, as a trigger. We know what to do if the heart rate is low. We need to breathe for the baby. And uh, obviously blood pressure. And then if you intervene, the heart rate comes up, the blood gases improve, and the baby begins breathing again. So this is the um, two ways. One is the central issue of breathing for the baby, and number two is the response time. So the quicker you respond in these animal experiments and baby experiments, the more easily you will resuscitate the baby. So the timing is very, very uh, critical. And we use this concept in, the, in a concept of, we termed it the, the golden minute, the first golden minute. So you recognize the baby's not crying, you position the head, clear the airway if, if, if uh, necessary, stimulate the baby, which works sometimes, and, um, and if the baby's not breathing, you initiate ventilation all within the first minute. And it, it really, it, it's very consistent with the science we have available. So this help, helping babies breathe concept is uh, using the science that's available, trying to make this harmonious with the more extensive programs like the neonatal resuscitation program and, and, and coinciding with WHO recommendations. It is nonprofit. It's inclusive of, of all providers and, and uh, it's free. So it's, uh, in this particular circumstance, it's directed where the need is the most, where the resources are limited. And the educational design goes along with adult learning. How do we learn? We learn because we're interested in a topic and sit in a conference or uh, read or something. That, and that's a basic part of really learning, is that you're interested in it. Um, it uses a concept of train the trainer that you know pretty well. It's got a toolkit. It focuses on ha on hands-on performance, which is it, you need the skill. You don't just need the theory, and um, and it's evidence-based. And the way we teach this is a learner to facility ratio that is six to one. So you know you have somebody really there to guide you, and you learn in pairs. So you actually teach your partner while you're learning, and which is another um, characteristic of adult learning. You learn much more by teaching than you will as a passive learner. So this paired uh, le learning and teaching uh, we use pretty, pretty frequently. So what are the results from these uh, helping, baby, helping Babies Breathe studies that we've done? One, we demonstrated that the skills can be acquired in a simple way, in a reliable way. It's associated with decreased perinatal mortality in three or four or five countries now. We've tried this out, and does it influence perinatal mortality? Yes. One of the things that happens is the number of stillborns that are recorded actually goes down, because sometimes um, the delivering 
person will, if the baby's not breathing, they'll classify it as a stillborn when the baby is really resuscitatable and, and potentially well. It, does, it is associated with a decrease in neonatal mortality. In one study in Tanzania, 47% decrease in neonatal mortality. In China, with NRP and some of these other uh, uh, interventions and support, of 40%, um, we, it's really closer to 50% decrease in neonatal mortality for a whole country. Uh, it, is a, uh, it has uh, elements of quality improvement in it. You teach the basic providers about quality improvement and how to make their practice better, how to make the outcome of the patient better. And it emphasizes supportive supervision, which we've demonstrated as a key element in being effective. So, um, we've expanded this to a more comprehensive package, which is Helping Babies Survive, there on the bottom of the slide is the title. And it's resuscitation and essential newborn care, quality improvement, and supportive supervision all together. So, um, you know, from, from your left, that third box, so the content is resuscitation, thermal protection, Breastfeeding, emphasis on breastfeeding, skin-to-skin -skin care, uh, hygiene, care planning, quality improvement, and support up and down the chain of command. To make this work, you really have to have that. So the perinatal, uh, perinatal impact is 40% or greater. So uh, that just repeats some of that information. Um, so we've also learned a bit more about how to really build and retain skills in a, in a community. High frequency, it, it, you don't have to have big density training, but if you do it repetitively, repetitively you, you will retain and actually improve skill. Um, and it is clearly superior to episodic training. This is a formula I'd like to call to your attention, an Epstein formula for survival. This was formed around life support issues, but it has application here for the newborn. So if you have medical science, and we have a lot of science about proper resuscitation, that's good. We now, I, I think, have well on our way to getting educational efficiency. We can, we can educate people. They can learn, they can retain. The, but it needs to be locally implemented in order to have survival. So this is that formula for uh, survival with life support. And applied to the newborn, if you've got science, and we're, we've got abundant science here, that's good. We've got education, that's good. Let's say 90% theoretically for both of those. And if you have implementation at a country level, at a community level, you'll get a lot of accomplishment. 73% by this calculation. But even if you've got the science and you've got the, the education, if your implementation is limited, it will drastically affect your accomplishment. So you won't get a community impact, or it could be very small. So, you know, I'm, I'm recommending that you consider these elements of how to make a program work. So, what, what organizational commitments are necessary? Government, obviously, but the professional societies can influence government, communities, et cetera. So, the professional societies, pediatricians, other physicians, midwives, nurses, uh, you have to have facility commitment, and you have to have community education. You have to bring the community along with you if you're gonna do something like this. So the role of a pediatric society uh, that many people have talked about is helping the science, advocating for the well-being of children, partnering with others, obstetricians, nurses, midwives. You know, that's something pediatricians are good at, is being good partners. And, and then education, which um, would be both in-service as well as pre-service. So, I'm, I'm saying for your societies, uh, this is my recommendation, quality improvement should be part of this. 
things like perinatal audits, assessment and planning, and importantly, an essential implementation role. I think without the pediatricians in a country, at a community, this is unlikely to get accomplished. So just reminding you of this formula for survival, we've got a lot of science, we've got really good tools for education efficiency, and we need implementation. So uh, what might we do together as pediatricians? National societies got skill and leadership positions. We could have an implementation plan under the Every Newborn Action Plan. Uh, if you wanted to start something in your own society, you can get help from the IPA, the AP, WHO, all together in this. And um, partnership should be mentioned again because that's so essential. We're not all, always there for every deliver. Somebody's going to be there, and that's the person that should be trained. And we also influence whether results get measured or not. And without measurement of results, you get very little action. So here's a, um, a website, uh, AP.org, uh, with helping babies survive. And uh, I've put my uh, email here in case you wanted to contact me if there's something that you want me to do or the IPA to do or the AP to do to help you and assist you in any way. We're, I think we are committed to that kind of activity. And in particular, you know, we're, we've got a good association with the International Confederation of Midwives, nursing, and the, uh, the obstetricians, the FIGO organization. So we've got those connections that we will strengthen over time here, and I encourage you to think about this for your own communities. So, I love this picture, I love the baby, I love the mother, and uh, I love you, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. William, for this interesting and attractive presentation. And by the end of the session, I introduce my great thanks to all my friends, chairpersons, Dr. Hana El Arabi, Dr. Hatim Hussein, Dr. Hisham Awad, Dr. Huda Tamun, Dr. Ama Hussein, Dr. Mustafa Sira, and uh, any questions? Thank you very much. Little question to Professor Mubin. <clears throat> Sir, you, 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 you elaborated a lot of light, really, about the difference between the airborne infection and the droplet infection. And you mentioned that six feet, almost two meters distance, should be apart between the physician and the CF patient. Do you mean this is in the regular daily practice with the CF patients, or you mean this while the patient is decompensated with serious illness in the hospital? And can you shed more light on this point? Because we're seeing now a lot of CF patients in our daily practice offices and hospital. Thank you very much. That's a question I often also get in the United States in large part because the practicality of that is, large, is rather difficult. Just to give you some background, those recommendations were made by a joint uh, group set up by the uh, Society of Hospital Epidemiology, uh, Healthcare Epidemiology of America, the CF Foundation, and CDC. And what the reason for that is because, as you well know, that the patients with CF are always colonized with some very resistant organisms. Uh, the one we see in the United States right now, which is causing a lot of problems, is mycobacterium abscesses. In the past, it was uh, other uh, uh, sepatia and such. And the reason for ha recommending that six feet is because these organisms can travel that far, and then they can cause uh, infection in other CF patients who may not be colonized by those organisms as of yet. And those are the probably who are at most risk. But in addition, these organisms can also uh, infect others who may not have CF, but may have other underlying health problems. Many of these organisms uh, that cause significant problems in CF patients may not always cause problems in otherwise healthy ch children. So the recommendation for six feet is regardless whether they are sick or not. Because the practicality of that is so challenging, the 
other part that I said is take them directly to a room so they don't expose anybody in your waiting room. Also, in your office practice, and also in, whether it's an emergency department or the hospital, put on a mask on these patients. So it's sort of reverse. Most of the time we would put a mask on ourselves so we don't get the organism. In this case, you're putting the mask on the patient so they don't transmit the infection. Not dissimilar to when you transport a patient who has respiratory infection in the hospital to x-ray or somewhere else, that you'll put a mask on them also. So that's the recommendation. So it has got nothing to do with them being decompensated. Clearly, I think, I think your point is when they're decompensated, one of the thought is that at that point in time, they may have a higher inoculum or, or, or load of these organisms, so they may be shedding much more, but the protection and six feet dif uh, distance is for all times. Yeah. Thank you very much, that's very helpful. Any more questions? Any more questions? Okay. Thank you very much, and now we move to the next session.